This is totally wrong, isn't it? You weren't involved in that job at all, right? Oh, come on. Hey, Sarah. You know it too, right? I know. But if the COO accuses Ryan and he admits it, there's nothing more we can do. A childhood friend of mine Sarah clenched her fists with a grinding of teeth. She must be more frustrated than I am, feeling helpless about the situation. Ryan, please wait. I'll talk directly to him. Maybe something will change. It's okay, Dan. These past few years working with you have been really fun. Sarah, don't be too hard on yourself, okay? That was all my decision. Ryan smiled with a lowered brow and shrugged his shoulders, unable to do anything but silently watch his back as he walked away from us. This is a bitter memory from the past that I still dream about. I am Dan Blackwell. I'm working in sales at a trading company. The days of being called a newcomer are long gone, and I've gotten to the point where I can handle my work reasonably well. As another fiscal year comes around, a few new employees have arrived. This year, I've been tasked with training the new employees, but honestly, I feel like quitting. The reason lies with one of the new employees I'm supposed to train. Her name is Maggie Williams. At first, she seemed like she wouldn't be a problem, but as soon as I started to teach her office work, her attitude completely changed. Uh, I'm really not interested in doing such mundane work. And don't ask me to make coffee just because I'm a new employee, okay? Can you let me go on sales calls right away? Staring at her as she said so with a sullen face, I was taken aback for a moment. Noticing that the other employees were holding their breath and watching, I cleared my throat and spoke up. Well, Maggie, this is a path that everyone goes through. We start with office work to get to know our clients. Then gradually, we'll have you join us on sales calls, okay? That's what I'm saying. I don't need that. I can get contracts without doing all that groundwork. Let me go on sales calls right away. Don't make me say it twice. Although she was adamant despite my attempts to persuade her, I managed to get her to do some data entry that day. However, she showed no enthusiasm, often switching to her smartphone after a brief attempt at work. When I pointed it out and asked her to take her job seriously, she glared at me with annoyance. The other employees looked uneasily our way every time I had to reprimand her. There was a reason the atmosphere froze whenever she became upset. Maggie is the daughter of the COO, John Williams. Moreover, it seems John dotes on her, having arranged her employment through connections after her job search was unsuccessful. It might have been okay if the executive was a decent person. But in reality, despite not being capable, he seemed to have climbed the corporate ladder by stepping on others. He only thinks of his own benefit, readily blaming others for his mistakes. I feel many have left the company because of him, but without solid proof, he continues to act arrogantly. On Maggie's first day, he came to the sales department and asked us to take good care of his daughter. Although he was smiling, it felt like a threat if anything happened to her. Thus, the sales department staff are quite nervous around Maggie. However, since I've been assigned to guide her, I can't just comply with her demands out of fear of the executive. Doing so would only cause problems for her later on. Moreover, if she were to go on sales calls unprepared, it could inconvenience our clients. With that in mind, I strictly told her what was unacceptable. Even though she continued to complain about mundane tasks, I never allowed her to go on sales calls. I've been assigning data entry and document organization tasks to get her familiar with our clients, but she insists she doesn't need to and refuses to take her work seriously. Every time I see her slacking off on her phone, I don't let it slide and continue to remind her. One day, after the back and forth, Maggie finally snapped with her face turning red with anger. Hey, how much longer are you going to make me do this? I told you I can do it. 
If you keep pestering me, I'll tell my dad. Whether you can do it or not isn't the point right now. You can't make proper attitude with me, your mentor. I can't send you out on sales if there's a risk you'll disrespect our clients. If you want to go out on sales so badly, then seriously complete the tasks you're given and show me that you can. I replied calmly, she gritted her teeth and stormed out of the floor. Probably she headed to her father, the COO John. Colleagues around me asked if I was okay, but showing fear wasn't an option. I reassured them and went back to work until Maggie returned after lunch, predictably bringing John with her. Are you Dan? My daughter seems to be under your care a lot, but why won't you let her go on sales? He demanded with an intimidating smile, I also responded with a smile. Hi, Mr. Williams. Regarding Maggie, as her mentor, it's my responsibility not to send her out half-prepared and risk causing trouble for our clients. Of course, I'll support her in any situation, but ultimately, she has to take responsibility. To avoid such situations, first, she needs to. Before I could finish, he suddenly grabbed my shirt front. Enough with the nonsense. Maggie says she can do it. It's only natural to let her do the job she wants to do, isn't it? Understood. So, this is an order from you, right? And if anything happens, you'll take full responsibility? I asked, no longer hiding my irritation, he gave a vague reply and released his grip. I had anticipated his reluctance to accept blame, but with many witnesses around, I hoped they would testify if needed. Satisfied that I had agreed to his demand, he snorted and left the floor. Left behind, Maggie smiled triumphantly and muttered. You got what you deserved. I sighed and straightened my tie, starting to worry about the clients I had entrusted to her. The next day, I decided to let Maggie handle some sales visits. These were all clients I had good relationships with, and I had explained the situation to them beforehand. I briefly informed her about the clients and what proposals she should make, but she seemed uninterested in listening. I had already briefed the clients on the content of her presentations, so all that was left was for her to confirm and get the signatures on the contracts. However, to avoid provoking her pride, I decided to ask her to start with product proposals, thinking that a bit of failure would be acceptable given the groundwork I had laid. After emphasizing the importance of politeness and immediate communication in case of any issues, I watched her leave, who was full of confidence. I managed to work in a relatively peaceful environment until I realized that Maggie, who had left in the morning, hadn't returned by the evening. It was clear something had happened, but there was no contact. Just as I was about to call her, she returned being visibly frustrated. Relieved but apprehensive, I listened as she approached, ranting. Listen to what happened. The contact at the last client I visited didn't understand a thing I was saying. I got a bit irritated and spoke sharply, and then they started threatening to cancel our current contracts. So, I told them we were better off without them. Then they got even angrier, and I told them it was their fault before I left. I couldn't immediately grasp what she was reporting, even as she handed me contracts from the other clients, saying, I managed to secure these. My anger didn't subside. Maggie, listen. Do you understand what you've done? The clients you visited today were originally my responsibility. They are all understanding and wouldn't normally react like that. I need to hear the full story but it's clear there's a reason that happened. No one works alone here, you know. Your selfish actions could jeopardize everyone's livelihood. We all bear that responsibility, working hard every day. And what about you? All you've done is complain, causing trouble for everyone, and now you've botched the job you insisted on doing. When I raised my voice, she froze, mouth agape. She was perhaps expecting sympathy for her, it's hard time. Unfortunately, 
the workplace and the tasks assigned there are not so lenient. Just as I was about to address the potentially furious client, John charged over, furious. It seems he had witnessed me scolding his daughter. You've got some nerve yelling at my daughter. What? A boss is supposed to laugh off acute Mendy's mistakes and cover for them. At that moment, the emotions I had been suppressing deep inside erupted all at once. I couldn't hold back any longer. Laugh off a mentee's mistake and cover for them as a boss. Are you serious about that? If you are, then yell the same thing at yourself in the mirror. How could you say such a thing? Do you have any idea how many people have quit because you pushed your mistakes onto them? I shouted and glared at him, he was taken aback for a moment, his eyes widening. But then, he glared back and started. Quite a thing to say without any evidence, right? Don't think you can yell at me and get away with it. You're fired. Expect your termination notice in a few days, so pack your things, okay? This is what happens when you get cocky. If you're going to blame someone, blame yourself. Facing the smirking executive, a sense of powerlessness washed over me once again. Yet, as I continued to glare at him, the sound of light footsteps approached. Turning toward the sound, there stood Crane, the CEO's daughter. She approached without a smile, giving the hastily bowing executive a cold stare. John, I've been looking for you. There's something important I need to discuss. It seems to me that you're the one who's been getting carried away, doesn't it? I heard you were shouting about firing him just now, but unfortunately, you no longer have that authority. We've been investigating the unnatural high rate of voluntary resignations in the sales department. It appears you've been pushing your mistakes onto your colleagues, forcing them to resign as a way of taking responsibility. Of course, we have solid evidence. Shall we go over it together? Hearing her words, John's face turned pale. Standing next to him, Maggie looked back and forth between her father and Crane, disbelief written all over her face. Unable to come up with an excuse, John was led out of the floor by Crane. After watching him leave, I exhaled deeply and started preparing to visit our clients. Come with me. I told Maggie, who was about to cry, nodded and followed. I heard sniffles from behind but didn't look back as we moved forward. Eventually, the COO John William was fired. Crane had presented irrefutable evidence, and even he tried to find a way out, but had to admit his wrongdoing. With he gone, Maggie began working earnestly as if she had transformed into a different person. Without the COO's protection, other employees gradually started talking to her. And now, I'm guiding her with their help. She seems to be having a tough time, but there's a lively look on her face. She's become obedient to the instructions of not just me but other employees as well, asking questions and taking notes. Just seeing her growth almost brought me to tears, but I decided to save those tears for the day she can stand on her own. Some time later, I found myself walking into a bar. Looking around, I spotted my childhood friend named Ryan waving at me. Good to see you. He greeted with a smile. I had told him I really needed to talk, so he came. Waiting with a beer, Crane soon arrived saying. Hey, guys. How is it going? We raised our glasses, the three of us laughing and toasting together. The truth is the CEO's daughter Sarah Crane is also a childhood friend of Ryan and me. However, we decided to keep our friendship a secret to avoid any speculative looks from others. That day when Sarah approached, I almost called out her first name and had to swallow it in panic. Once the snacks were on the table, Ryan asked. What's up today? I looked at Sarah and said. It's all done. His eyes widened for a moment before he smiled softly. Oh, that's nice. In fact, Ryan had also worked at that company owned by Sarah's father until a few years ago. It was unexpected to reunite in that way after going our separate paths following high school, 
but I still remember how we all laughed out loud when we saw each other again. Sarah had been studying business management to take over her father's position, so she wasn't seen much around the company. However, being assigned to the same sales department as Ryan meant we saw each other daily and worked together on tasks. With Ryan, it felt like any difficult task could be tackled. But one day, Ryan suddenly announced he was quitting the company. At that time, he didn't share anything with me, leaving me no choice but to silently see him off. After settling into a new job at an IT company, he got in touch and we arranged to meet up after a long time. That's when he finally told me what had happened back then. Apparently, the COO John was concerned about rumors of his incompetence and wanted to prove he could handle sales. Despite Ryan's attempts to stop him, John confidently went to negotiate with a major company, only to be completely outmaneuvered and return with a contract that resulted in losses. Ryan knew about John's sales trip, and unfortunately discovered the contract first. After carefully explaining the severity of the situation, Ryan ended up being blamed for it. Fearing that struggling might drag other employees into the mess, he decided to resign in order to take responsibility for the loss-making contract. I immediately shared that story with Sarah. Since Ryan's resignation, she had been looking for a way to expose John's misdeeds, which seemed to be a constant source of dark rumors. Not being able to do anything for Ryan back then must have been a shock for her. She then reached out to Ryan, asking for his help, to gather evidence for the case that led to the forced resignations, which was the trump card used to confront the executive. Sarah, you always goes to extremes, right? It's been years since I left the company, you should just leave me be. There's no way I could just leave it be. You think I could stay silent when my dear childhood friend gets caught up in something like that? I'm not that sweet of a girl, you know? Besides, as the future president, I wanted to rid the company of such a harmful man as soon as possible. Well, anyway, this wraps up one issue. We can go back to being just childhood friends now, right? As I muttered, Ryan and Sarah started laughing out loud. Confused, I snapped at them, and they tried to hold back their laughter before speaking up. You know, I never thought I'd hear you say something so modest. Have you always thought that way? You're surprisingly sweet. While glaring at Sarah's teasing laughter, Ryan suddenly called my name. What? I turned, and he pressed his fist against my chest. Must have caused you a lot of worries because of me, right? Don't worry, Dan. Nothing has changed between us. We're the same as when we used to run around every after school, and it's not going to change. Let's keep laughing together like idiots forever. His words nearly brought tears to my eyes, but I held them back and smiled just as widely. Ryan and Sarah then raised their beer-filled mugs again. Cheers. We clinked our mugs together, laughing, and I felt my heart fill with happiness. I took another swig of my beer, engraving the smiles of my dear childhood friends in my memory.